All right, let's go on. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu now sends Moshe Rabbeinu off to, uh, the, to the Jewish people. Let's start with Parshas Veira, this week's Parsha. Okay, so skip on ahead to uh, Puzzle 318. Okay, this is where the action begins. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, God comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, and, uh, um, and then we see something very, very peculiar. Take a look at Perik Vav. God, God charges them with the, with, with, with the, with the job. And uh, page 320, page 320. I'll show you a very interesting Rashi over here. So, uh, Torah says like this. It's about uh, one, two, three, eight lines from the top. Plus like Yud Gimel. If you, show, if you find it, please show the person next to you so everybody, everybody can see where it is. Vaydavra Hashem on Moshe Aaron. God speaks to Moshe and Aaron. Vayitzave Mel Bnei Yisrael. He orders them. To go to the Bnei Israel, the El Paro Melech Mitzrayim, the Paro of the King of Egypt, Lahotzias Bnei Israel Meretz Mitzrayim. Now it's the order. Okay, now we're going to start the action. We're going to get into the ten plagues, and after all the talk, talk of the previous parsha, go, don't go. I don't want to go. You have to go. I don't want to go. Back and forth. Now we're getting ready for the final, the final uh, uh, send off into Paro's lair, and Moshe and Rabbeinu have to do it. Now I'm going to show you something remarkable. What Rashi says over here. Take a look in Pasuk Yud Gimel. It's the left column. It's the left column. And it's almost, it's about uh, 10 lines from the top of the page on the left column on page 320. It says, Rachi says, El Paro Melech Mitzrayim. Again, if you, if you find it, please show the person next to you. Make sure the person next to you has it. El Paro Melech Mitzrayim. So Moshe, God is sending Moshe and Aaron to Paro Melech Mitzrayim. It's about 10 lines from the top. So it says like this, El Paro Melech Mitzrayim. Says Rashi. Tzivim Olov, he commanded them regarding him, regarding Paro, lachalok lo kavod bedivrehim, to give him honor with their words, when they speak to Paro. It's a king, you can honor him. Zel Midrosho, that's what it says. That Medr says that when the Torah emphasizes you're going to Paro, the king of Egypt, well, I didn't say Paro Melech Mitzrayim, we know he's the king. You have to speak to him like a king. You have to talk to him like a king. So, uh, you know, you listen to the irony over here. What are they about to inform him? Let the people go. Otherwise, you're going to get, you're going to suffer worse than anybody has ever suffered in history. So this is the proverbial with all due respect, right? <laughs> Speak to Paro and say, with all due respect, sir, uh, you're going to be invaded by frogs. You know, with, with all due respect, you know in life, by the way, life experience, uh, whenever anybody says to you, with all due respect, you're about to get insulted and usually badly. You know, with all due respect, sir, you're totally incompetent. You know, but I said with all due respect, you know, <laughs> with all due respect, don't worry, with all due respect, you are completely unsuitable for this position. And, uh, you know, but as long as I said with all due respect. So the Jewish people say to Paro, now why is that? Why is it that God says to him to speak that? Okay, so the first idea is, well, you're, you know, a person, just because I, a person occupies a certain position, you have to deal with the person at his position. The only thing more says that when you give tzedakah, part of tzedakah is helping a person maintain his level, the level that he's used to. One of the most difficult things in life is for a person to take a step down in his living style. It's a very, very difficult thing, not just because of the physical discomfort, because you're used to that's who you've become. And it means a, a complete, you're a king. So with it, with all due respect, sir, bow, whatever you say, you are going to send, please send the Jewish people, or we are going, you are going to get, uh, you're going to be severely punished. So that's idea number one. But the other commentaries say like this. You see, we've mentioned, it's a theme that we've mentioned in the past. A person may deserve, for any one of several reasons, a person may deserve some sort of degree of suffering in life. Say a person deserves his card. For whatever he did, it could be a punishment, it could be a test, I don't, whatever reason a person is suffering. A person may deserve to go through some sort of, some sort of uh, inconvenience. Now, do you deserve the inconvenience of your car breaking down? Could be you do. Do you deserve the inconvenience of having a flat tire on your car? Yeah, it could, could be you do. Do you deserve the inconvenience of when your car is broken down, having to wait for the repair people when you call them? That not. So it could be that you're in a situation, your car breaks down, it's going to cost you money, you pick up your phone to call the, what's it called, AAA or whatever it is, and there's a AAA guy who happens to be parked right on the side of the road. I mean, that, why, why, why did that happen? Well, wow, he's never showed up that fast. He was, he was right here just fixing somebody else's car because you didn't deserve that suffering. In other words, the suffering that a person gets is measured out to the nth degree. 
when a person goes through a difficult an ordeal, so sometimes we just think, okay, I'm in a down right now. I'm in a bad zone and everything is going wrong. You know, my girlfriend broke up with me. My parents are giving me a hard time. I lost my job. My car got stolen. Everything's going wrong. And it's just, you know, I'm just in the wrong, you know, I was born under the wrong star. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. Every ounce of suffering is measured out precisely. And that's why while the suffering goes on, often you find that something good happens during the suffering. You could, you could, what do you call it? You're, you're, you know, they got to tow your car in and you brought, they bring it into the gas station, into, into the shop. And while you're standing there, the guy's got the TV on. It's one of the best games you've ever seen. While you're waiting for your car to get fixed. Like, wow, this is really a good game. You know, you're, you just, it, it just is great. Well, why, I mean, by, by rights, either that there should be a game at all or should be a lousy game or your team should lose. It doesn't work that way. Every ounce of suffering is measured out precisely to the nth degree. Paro deserves to go through all the sufferings he can go through. He does not deserve the indignity of not being treated as a king. Therefore, God says, this is not part of the, part of the punishment. You don't talk disrespectfully to a king. You have, to, you have to treat him the way he's meant to be treated as a king because he doesn't deserve that punishment because it's measured out to the nth degree. Okay? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu comes to, Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Paro, and then uh, he tells, he, he, they go through the, the, first he throws down the staff and, 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 and the staff as well. They go through the whole story. Then God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, we're going to start with the plagues. And on page 326, on page 326 uh, in the middle of the page, it says like this, uh, right where there's a blank space, right on page 326. God says to Moshe, it's about uh, eight lines from the bottom of the page. Pesach Yud Tes, Pesach 19. Vayomer Hashem al-Moshe, Amor al-Aron, kach kach matcha, take your staff, munate yodcha al-meime mitzrayim, stretch your staff out over the waters of Egypt, al-Naharosam, the rivers, val-Yorehem, the little streams, val-Agmeim, the ponds, val-Kol mikveh mimeim, v'yudam, to turn to blood. There's going to be blood everywhere in Egypt. All right, so this is the first plague. First plague is blood. So, you know, you have to put this in the proper perspective, what it means to have blood everywhere, right? Everywhere you are, a guy's on a diving board in Egypt, and he's about to dive into the water, you know, and all of a sudden the water just turns red, and that's before he's even hit the water. In the middle of a jump, he's in the middle of a somersault. You know, next thing you know, you're in blood. You're in blood. You know, you go into the river, they used to bathe in the Nile. You, know, you could have people swimming around. All of a sudden, the, ugh, it's blood, it's gooey, it's, it's like the Dead Sea. You know, you ever been to the salt, the, the Dead Sea, it's kind of ooey and gooey. This is blood. It's got the texture of blood. It smells like blood, tastes like it's blood. Now, you got a technical problem. I mean, they turn on their faucet in Egypt, and it's blood. They in the middle of a shower, and down comes blood. Everywhere, everywhere you go, there's blood. So uh, the, the commentary explains he starts with the Nile. They almost worship the Nile, and therefore the Nile is... The Nile seed is a godlike type of thing. Okay, so you start with the blood. Now you got a technical problem for the Egyptians. There are different opinions whether the plague lasted for a week or lasted for three weeks. What's the first problem that you have? They're going to die. They're going to die, maybe. Why should they die? No water. No water. What do you do for water? What do you do for water? So the Medrash says there's only one way the Egyptians could get water. Buy it from the Jews. Now you're in trouble. <laughs> now, now you're in trouble. If an Egyptian drew water out of, drew out of a well, it turned to blood. The Jew drew it out of the same well, it was water. Now what do you do? The only, if the Egyptian would take it from the Jew, it turned to blood. Now what do you do? You're going to have to buy it. <laughs> I'm sure the Jews gave him a discount. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jew, can I get a little water off of you? Yeah, well, you know, things are rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's like one of these bottled water geschäfts. You know, some guy in the back room with a faucet, you know, turning it on, they put it in a bottle, sells it to us. You know, and I'm sure the Jews took full advantage of the Egyptians here for a cup of water over there. <laughs> it sure is good. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it, now, what's the idea here? What's the idea of different new water, blood? Well, before we talk about what the, what the plagues individually symbolize, What's the idea of the ten plagues? What is really the idea? What's behind the entire thing? Anybody know? What's the whole concept? What's underlies? Not the not what the plagues were. The idea of having plagues. What's the idea here? Yeah. Um, I think the idea might be uh, returning all the suffering that 
Yeah. That's certainly part of it. That's certainly part of it, the suffering. But what does God need to bring 10 plagues for? God could just as easily just take the Jews out of his What do you say, Mike? Uh, to show to what degree people are willing to deceive themselves in order to not believe, to deny it. That's certainly part of it, to show you how obstinate people could be. When, you know, from one or two of these plagues, you'd be like, all right, I give up. Right, but right, to show how obstinate, good, 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 to show how obstinate. Do you know that in a 1973, in the Yom Kippur War, uh, in Israel, the Yom Kippur War, which was the worst war that Israel, that, that Israel had, after the Yom Kippur War, they couldn't fill the demand for tefillin in this country. Soldiers were coming, secular soldiers were coming back from the front, and they said, listen, I saw God. I saw God in that war. Hey, there were Egyptians. They threw grenades and forgot to pull the pin on them. Right? They threw grenades. They forgot to pull the pin. They just picked them up and threw them back. Hey, hey, fellas, you forgot this. You know, and they throw it back. They had, they had a situation that the, the Egyptian army, the Egyptian army broke through the first, the, first, the first walls of defense. There was nothing between them and Tel Aviv. And they started advancing and they stopped because they figured we didn't plan on getting here. Now what? We didn't even have a plan. We didn't ever expect it to be. They just stopped. Some of them thought it was a trap that these guys are trying to draw them in. There were other guys on the Golan Heights. Uh, Avigdor Kalani. <laughs> Avigdor Kalani was on the Golan Heights with two tanks. Him and another tank. There was an entire Syrian division. And the Israelis had these American tanks or whatever they get their thing. The, 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 the Egyptians had, had Russian tanks. And so the Israeli turrets, the, the turrets of the Israeli tanks were able to get down at a better angle than they could get up. So the Syrian tanks were down in a ridge, and they couldn't get their turrets up to shoot at these two guys. These two guys had a turkey shoot. They knocked out about 40 tanks up there, and they, you know, boom, boom, boom. You know, yeah. When's the last time that happened? And, you know, in, in, in West Point, as I mentioned this many times, it's a, it's, a, it's a really remarkable idea. West Point Military Academy, the non-Jewish generals, when they teach military strategy, will not use Israel's wars as mil for military strategy because the, they said Israel's wars are won by miracle. Those are one of my miracles. Yeah, what are we going to teach you? Yeah, get the enemy not to pull the pins on the grenades. You know, <laughs> hey guys, woo, here we are, <laughs> throw. Hey, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to get the? You know, you catch, you catch in the, in, in the '67 war. They caught the Egyptian air force. They caught the Egyptian air force on the ground. The whole Egyptian air force. At 10:15, they knew that the Egyptian pilots take a tea break. So they all leave their planes. And at 10:15, the Israelis came. That's a great strategy. Knock out the entire air force of the other of the enemies. On the first day of the war, let's teach that. You know, if you can do that, then the rest of it, you got it made. You got it made. Oh, you know, when's the last? When's the last time that happened in history? All right? You know, you understand? So it's, it's it's ridiculous. The goal over here is, and you're right. So there was a demand on Philin for two weeks, and then after two weeks, it died. The demand died. The rush on Philin died. You know why? Because when you come back after two weeks, it's like, well, you know, it happens, and this happens, and all of a sudden you, you move. It. So over here, the Egyptians, is exactly what the test is. You know, there's blood, and afterwards, you know, well, you know, the Jews, uh, they're sorcery, or maybe they had a, a geshefta over there. I don't know what they were doing. The idea behind it is, the idea behind the whole thing is to show what's called hashgacha pratis. Hashgacha pratis means Hashem's divine intervention in the running of the world that God is involved on a personal level in the running of the world. Now, this is a very important introduction to the whole theme over here. Very few people in history, if anybody, have denied the fact that there's a creator. Nobody believes the world exploded into a perfect, or into a perfect order. There was a big bang, and everything just blew up, and he ended up with a perfect world, except for Cleveland. It's a perfect world. Uh, no, nobody in the world, nobody in the world ever, ever said, uh, yeah, the world just blew up, and we ended up with Cleveland. All right, that could be. But nobody would say, well, we ended up, you know, the world blew up, and we ended up with Denver. That nobody would say. You know, that, that nobody would say. Nobody, that's, that's ridiculous. Obviously, there's a creator. Where do we park company? You say, yeah, there's a creator, but the creator really couldn't care less if I put on tefillin and if I eat kosher. He has nothing to do with me on a personal level. To that, God said, even Paro, when Moshe Rabbeinu first shows up, Paro says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Mi Hashem, who is God? Yud K Vav K, spelled out with the Yud and then the He and then the Vav and then the He. Who is God that I should listen to him? In other words, Paro believes there's a creator, but not that there's a personal God involved in the day-to-day -day running of the world. What have I got to do with a personal God? What, what's a personal God that got to do with me? God care? God created the world and said, live. Which obviously, the benefit is I got nothing to lose by that. There's a God. I'm willing to concede there's a God. 
but I don't have to do any person. I have no personal obligations. It absolves me from all responsibility because God does not care whether I put on tefillin or I don't put on tefillin. So why believe in other deities? There are different opinions whether other de other deities were a way that they believe that the other deities could bring about certain benefits. No obligations, though. No obligation. That's why all the reform movements throughout Jewish history have always believed in a written Torah. The written Torah, all reform, conservative, all the all the reform re reforming groups have always believed, have always paid tribute. Yeah, there's a Torah, there's a history, everything else, but no obligations. Halacha is not binding according to reform doctrine. Halacha is not binding; it's an option. I don't have to do that. That's ridiculous that I should have to do such a thing. All groups throughout Jewish history that have broken away from Torah has been to try to release us from our obligations. This goes back to what Mike said earlier. People ask, well, if Judaism is true and it's so obvious, so why aren't more people religious? There's an answer. And that's why people are, the answer is called cheeseburgers. That's the answer. The answer is, yeah, well, in, in the best scenario, there are worse things. Right? The answer is, yeah, <laughs> because if I'm religious, then I've got all sorts of limitations and I don't want to be limited. That's the answer we have because we have an ulterior motive. We have a bias in the other direction. So what God, I'll get to you one second. What God does is God brings the plagues and shows you, you know how precise this is? You want to see what a precise God is? For him, it's blood, and for him, it's water. For him, one half of the pool is water. For him, one half of the pool is blood. That shows you that God is involved directly, and he gives you a 10-step ulpan. There are those who accept it, and there's those who don't accept it. Because as human beings, we have free choice, and we could blind ourselves because we are afraid to take on the commitment. That is the argument, the oldest argument we see right through it. If a guy comes to me and says, listen, I don't want to become religious because I just don't want the obligations. I respect that. Not that it's okay to do so, but I respect you. You're being honest. You're being honest. I just don't feel, I'm not religious because I don't feel like having to do what I'm told. Good. Then don't get married either. Right? Because that's worse, right? So, so if a guy says, I'm not religious, I don't, I don't want to be told what to do. I understand that. The guy says, I'm not religious because there was a big bang. You know, that, then you're just coming up and they try to make sophisticated excuses for, to, justify, to justify that behavior. Question, we have to stop. Go ahead. Yeah, but where would you put like pogroms as a motivation to become less religious? Everybody could use, it's a good question, everybody could use anything they want as motivation if they want to find an excuse. There are people who came out of the Holocaust stronger religiously, people came out of the Holocaust that they can't be a God, and we don't judge them. The guy's bitter. So I understand, say you're bitter. Okay, we understand you're bitter. And he, say, he feels, okay, I understand. But not because of an intellectual, that I worked it out intellectually, because there's too much intellectually. If you want to be intellectually, it's too, it's too obvious intellectually that it's right. Guy comes along and says, listen, at the end of the day, I'm using it as an intellectual excuse because I have certain desires and I don't feel like curbing my desires. Okay, that I understand that. We have no problem. We understand. We all have that. We all have that challenge. That I understand. Not that guy comes along and says, well, yeah, you know, there's doing like this or like that, the other. Guy comes up with all sorts of sophisticated, sophisticated excuses. So a guy says, well, there was a, you know, if the Holocaust happened, a good God, God couldn't allow a Holocaust. How do you know? How do you know? Who told you? Who told you? You're talking from emotion. The guy says, the Holocaust, God, God couldn't have been there if there was a Holocaust. Who, who said, do you have some substantiation for that? Do you have any proof for that? Obviously, the guy says, could be he's bitter, could be he's using it as an excuse, whatever it is. We're not judging somebody who went through a difficult, a difficult situation. At the end of the day, it has nothing to do with intellectual honesty. It has to do with a person's desire. That's what it boils down to. So God comes along and says, listen, I'll give you the ultimate proof. I'm going to give you the proof. I'll give you as much as I can give you, but I'm not taking away your free choice. Here, here's the evidence. The evidence is right there. For him, it's blood. For you, it's water. Now, you decide if there's a God or not. That's all I'm going to tell you. The guy says, no, I'll stay. Okay, you use your free choice. Okay, to be continued. Okay.